How do we measure playmaking in basketball? The classical approach is to look at assists, but do assists really tell us everything we need to know about passing or shot creation? First off, we know that all assists aren't created equally. Some assists are incredible passes that could be finished by nearly anyone, and other assists come off idle passes where the receiver does most of the work. During the Doc Rivers Celtics years, Rajon Rondo would pile up a huge number of these basic assists by hitting skilled players like Ray Allen off of his movement or Kevin Garnett who would then drill long jumpers. Compare these assists to this dime from Kobe Bryant where the defense reacts to his scoring threat by double teaming him which creates a 4 on 3 power play and leads to a good shot for the Lakers. Sometimes creating shots for teammates like this doesn't even directly lead to an assist. On this play, Denver doubles Kobe, leaving two teammates open, yet nothing shows up in the box score for Bryant, even though he caused the defenses to leave his teammates unguarded. Years ago, I was so curious about these opportunities that players created for their teammates that I began obsessively charting thousands of these plays to study them in detail. Even though there's no traditional stat measuring shots created in the box score, it turns out that the right combination of box stats can accurately estimate how often players create these opportunities for their teammates. This box score measurement of shots created, which I call box creation, is an estimate of the number of open shots a player creates for teammates by forcing help defenders to react. Unsurprisingly, Rondo repeatedly led the league in the difference between his assist totals and his shot creation totals. Furthermore, the particular combination of box stats needed to approximate shot creation revealed some valuable insight about offensive success in basketball. Players who don't threaten defenses with their scoring, like Rondo, have high assist totals but low creation totals. But players who score a lot and also had low assist totals typically aren't creating many shots for their teammates either. So in order to generate offense for others, lead players need to balance their threat to score with their threat to pass. Some lean more toward scoring, others more toward creating, but too much of either extinguishes that playmaking threat. To paraphrase what Oscar Robertson once said, the hardest thing about basketball is knowing when to shoot and when to pass, and finding that right balance can punish defenses. Box creation isn't a perfect measurement of playmaking. Sometimes defenses react to multiple players in an action, like the screener and the ball handler, and creating layups is more valuable than creating open mid-range jumpers. But this creation metric is far more contextualized than assists or even assist percentage alone, and quantifies one of the fundamental components of the sport. Box creation also gave birth to another stat, offensive load, which estimates how involved a player is in the offense. This was a natural extension of John Hollinger's usage rate, which was trying to measure offensive involvement by using scoring attempts, turnovers, and a fraction of a player's assists. Most cited usage today is actually Justin Kubotko's version, the founder of Basketball Reference, and his usage was based on scoring attempts and turnovers alone. But that brings us back to one of our fundamental questions in this series. What exactly is traditional usage rate measuring? Taken literally, it's measuring scoring attempts and turnovers, but are most turnovers committed when a player is trying to score? In 2019, almost half of the turnovers in the league were committed on passes. Another 13% of turnovers were offensive fouls, but is a player going to shoot or pass when he commits an offensive foul? Take this play for example, Kobe Bryant turns it over penetrating, but this defensive reaction could lead to a Bryant shot or a pass. So common usage rate measures scoring volume along with turnovers from scoring and turnovers from playmaking, but it doesn't have any traditional playmaking component. On the other hand, offensive load fills in that gap by providing scoring volume and playmaking volume. Playmaking volume is represented by shots created, opportunistic passes, or turnovers from playmaking. What exactly is an opportunistic pass? Let's go back to that hockey assist from Kobe earlier. Kobe pulls the defense toward him and this leads to a shot, so he's credited with creating one, but passes are still required for the ball to get there and take advantage of that opportunity. Sometimes the player who creates the shot cashes in by hitting an open shooter directly, but 
As we see here, sometimes a teammate is the one who fires the extra pass. So that additional passing component keeps track of extra passes like this after a teammate moves the defense. It also keeps track of passes that exploit openings for other reasons as well. This defender is momentarily preoccupied with cross-screening action, and that slight window is somehow enough for Magic Johnson to capitalize on it. Passing ability itself can be viewed as related to but separate from shot creation. So to complement box creation, I charted thousands of passes like this and scored them as either elite passes, good passes, missed elite passes or missed good passes. For example, when a team has a wide open layup but the player never makes the pass. Then using both the number of passes a player connected on and the number of passes he missed, I created a metric called passer rating to estimate passing ability. Passer rating relies mostly on the box score to detect relationships between traditional stats like assists and a player's role in the offense, as well as looking at what percentage of a player's assists lead to layups, indicative of higher quality passes. It's then converted to essentially a 1 to 10 scale so it feels intuitive. Passer rating can overrate taller, conservative guards, but otherwise it gets players pretty close to where manual tracking gets them. Its other potential weakness is underrating big volume scores because huge scoring numbers drive down passing in general. This is more of a philosophical preference as most massive scorers call their own number instead of fishing for these better passing chances, even if they're more capable passers in other circumstances. Either way, passer rating and offensive load allow us to make inferences about on-ball and off-ball playmaking that are impossible to detect by looking at assists alone. Some low assist players are great extra passers, while others are fairly weak passers who happen to have the ball a bit more. Note that Andre Iguodala's small load implies he's a strong extra passer, whereas Jamal Murray's above average load suggests he's not a great on-ball playmaker. One other subtlety to consider here, much like true shooting percentage doesn't tell us the types of shots a player takes, passer rating doesn't differentiate between a great pick and roll passer or a great transition passer. This is a natural downside of compressing any complex skill into a single number measurement. Fortunately, advancements in publicly available passing stats will help expand this in the future. We already have access to data like number of passes made and potential assists, and it's only a matter of time before we start quantifying the types of passes players make. So how do these concepts look at the team level? Well, box creation has a moderately strong relationship with offensive rating. That blue trend line tells us that as a team has stronger creators, its offense is generally better. That abysmal offense in the lower left is the 2012 Bobcats. They lacked any shot creators, whereas the best offenses of the decade all live in the upper right, powered by the game's elite shot creating engines. Passer rating has a weaker direct correlation to team success like this because team passing is often more about connective tissue that exploits the advantages that these stars create. As a result, the top offenses are somewhat more likely to feature strong passing talent that can supercharge a team, whereas really poor offenses are less likely to have good passers, and offenses in between can largely go either way. By the way, assist to turnover ratio has often been used as a proxy for a kind of passing efficiency, but this breaks down because turnovers and assists come in radically different varietals. An 80% completion rate on a pass like this will result in incredibly efficient offense, but a 90% completion rate on a vanilla inbounds pass won't really help an offense. So different kinds of turnovers have different impact based on what the turnover prevented from happening. A turnover while trying to score prevents that particular scoring attempt from taking place. The value on those attempts varies quite a bit depending on the player. Whereas a turnover on an idle pass early in the shot clock prevents the entire possession from unfolding, so a team loses the value of a possession. We could also have a turnover on a high-risk, high-reward pass that often prevents a layup from taking place, which would have incredible value. That means that never trying high leverage passes will suppress turnovers, but completing 100% of these idle passes in this hypothetical yields a status quo offensive rating of 100. However, 
connecting on only 70% of those premium passes yields layup after layup, and we'd expect an even better offensive rating of 105. In other words, we've traded in missed shots for more turnovers, only with a better overall return. Now that we have a more complete picture of playmaking, we can explain our turnover paradox from part three when Jason Kidd replaced Stefan Marbury in New Jersey back in 2002. Remember, Kidd was a higher turnover player than Marbury by adjusted turnover percentage. The adjustment here is calculating their turnovers as a percentage of their offensive load, not just their usage rate. Let's say Marbury committed more of his turnovers in idle situations or while trying to score, and Kidd committed more of his turnovers trying to find teammates with really high percentage passes. Kidd coughed it up more, but more helpful passes also squeezed through that Marbury would have never even tried. Kidd's passing put the other New Jersey players in more optimal positions to score, and so they didn't have to commit turnovers by forcing action outside of their comfort zone. The net result is more easy shots for the team and a better offense, despite Kidd throwing more total interceptions. Great passers won't always suppress teammate turnovers, but the larger point here is that higher turnovers can often be associated with better offensive play for individuals and for teams. In summary, assists and turnovers are not all created equally. This means turnovers can be a natural byproduct of high leverage passes, and that a strong assist to turnover ratio can be the byproduct of overly conservative offense. Box creation measures shot creation on and off ball, but not all creation is equal either. Passer rating measures the ability to throw these quality passes frequently and when teammates are open. And finally, offensive load is a more informative version of usage because it incorporates a playmaking component and a scoring component too. Next up in this series, we'll start to think about the very best ways to measure overall value. The proprietary stats in this episode are currently available to Patreon subscribers for every player and every team since 1955, as well as during the current season. If you're interested in more details, check out patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. Further links about this episode are in the description below. Otherwise, I hope you're enjoying this series and that you're having a great day.